Betty, this is Jason with Intermountain Healthcare. Thanks for joining the, the sepsis dissemination and implementation webinar today. Um, before we get started, if you can go to the next. Before we get started, uh, I'd just like to remind everybody uh, to, if you're not talking, um, to please put your phone on mute so we don't get any feedback. We are recording the webinar, and so um, the less feedback we can have, the better. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Lucy Savitz for some introductions and an overview. Great. Thank you for joining us today, everybody. My name is Lucy Savitz, and I'm the co-chair with Judy Tateman from Providence Health and Services of the Safety Program for High Value Healthcare Collaborative. And today we're really excited to have this first of our quarterly webinars um, to present content to you with two experts. Um, Andreas Tanzer, who's also a, an expert and a leader here, is our subject matter expert for sepsis. And, and he'll talk to you about the resources that we have available to support you and the website and how to access those resources. Um, and then we've got two speakers. Um, first, from Intermountain Healthcare, we have Dr. Terry Clummer, who will be talking about the lessons um, learned here at Intermountain in implementing the sepsis bundle over a very long period of time. And then secondarily, we'll be hearing from Shelley Schutzlitzlin Sanders um, from Providence St. Vincent Medical Center, who's going to talk about really becoming reliable and tips for achieving the sepsis bundle adherence. And, and hearing from these two systems, I think you'll gain a lot of good insights into what's going on. Um, we did um, collect information on the Pulse survey, and we'll be developing future webinars for you based on what we heard from you. And in a minute or two, we're going to be polling you to help prioritize those items. So again, um, thank you. I don't want to take up any more time. I'm going to turn it over to Jason for some housekeeping. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we are recording the webinar, so um, in a couple of days after we have the recording taken put together, we will have them posted um, in multiple places so you can access them easily. First is our hbhcsafety.org website where we have this and other previous webinars posted as well as other safety areas that we've addressed previously. And then it will also be available um, through the HBHC dissemination workspace site, and the link is here. And I, this may be as good a time as any to remind people if they haven't requested access to that website, um, you can request it just by going there and filling out the form and maybe Andreas will cover that in a little bit more detail. And then um, just one other ask we have of everybody on the phone and um, ask throughout your systems is if you have any success stories regarding um, some work that you've done with sepsis safety in your system. We'd love to hear about it so we can uh, learn from it and share that with the rest of the network. So if there is any success stories you have to share, please email us at admin at hbhcsafety.org um, so we can share that with the rest of the network. So as Lucy mentioned, we have a poll that uh, we'd like to conduct. It's a brief, simple poll that we'd like to get a kind of general feel of who's on the call and um, things that they're dealing with related to sepsis. So if we can get the poll up, it should be showing up on the right side of your screen. Um, in the poll, there's a, a polling drop-down box, and um, hopefully everybody can see it. If not, all your lines are available, so speak up if you're having problems. And as people are continuing to fill out the poll, um, we are going to just go over these really briefly to help our speakers also get a better feel of who's on the call so they can somewhat customize their presentation to those. We'll just give it a few 
few more seconds, it looks like people are wrapping up. All right. So, okay. So we've got, all right. Okay, yeah, we're going to go ahead and close the poll now. And I'll just be a second to get the results up for everybody to see. But yeah, so it looks like for the first question about how long this SS work's been going on, it looks like the majority of us on the call um, are between, well, two or more years, between two and five years and five and more years, which is great. Um, so like we also have some that are just getting started, which is also great. And then as far as the roles of people on the call, it looks like we've got a pretty good split among physicians uh, and other non-clinical roles um, and several QI specialists as well. Um, and then this is, again, as Lucy had mentioned, based on the results of the pulse check, we wanted to categorize some of the, the general themes that we had seen from those responses. And it looks like documentation and uh, uh, tools and EMR technology seem to be a primary issue, and as well as knowledge and identification of sepsis. Um, and communication or handoff issues. So thanks everybody for, for filling out the poll. We appreciate the feedback. Um, and also for you letting us know how many other people are on, on the call with you or in the room with you. All right, so if we can go to the next slide. And this is, oh, perfect. Okay, so we will turn it over to um, Dr. Penzier to go over this information. And, and as we do, please just remember to mute your line if you're not speaking, please. Although I love that baby or small child cry there in the background. <laughs> Um, this is Andrea speaking, and uh, first of all, I really would like to thank our hosts in the mountain and Lucy and Jason for, for hosting this great call. I'm really excited about today's webinar um, because Terry Klemmer truly is one of the great heroes of sepsis implementation, and I think I can speak for many in the collaborative that we have adopted many of the practices um, that, that Terry has implemented at Intermountain and copied and pasted a lot of those things. It actually allowed us to run a really accelerated sepsis implementation and improvement process. And I'm just as excited to have um, Sally Sanders present because I think just like us at Dartmouth, um, she at Providence has learned tremendously from that experience um, of uh, Intermountain and, and Terry Clemmer's work, so I'm really looking forward to this. Um, a lot of the information that will be presented today uh, will be or is already on a website um, that really serves the purpose of collaborative learning. Um, there are some great um, instructional videos that are um, made available to us from Intermountain there um, about uh, quality improvement in general. Um, there is already some great work from Providence, from Shelley up there um, in regards to inpatient sepsis detec detection. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes on how you actually maneuver to that website and get there. If you just go to Google, which is a interweb search engine. You can just punch in high value healthcare and that will get you to um, the highvaluehealthcare.org website. Um, and although you can't see it on that slide very well, on the upper right hand side of that website, circled in red, um, it says dissemination. And if you click on that link, it will bring you to a screenshot that you see in the lower right-hand corner where you can register for that website and obtain um, access to it. And um, Jason, if you can forward to the next slide. Um, as Jason, in much more eloquent words previously uh, communicated with you, 
the site is there to to share information, to share templates and tools to discover with other members. But really, this is a pledge to you to make information from your sites available to all other members. Um, because we're learning from each other and we can only learn if we make content available. Um, there are instructions on that website on how to do that and how to share these tools. Um, and I'll just have three quick slides on to show you how to navigate that site. Jason, if you just advance one more, please. So when you enter the site, you will land on the General Dissemination and Implementation tab. On that specific side will be tools that are just what it describes, uh, generic dissemination and um, spread work tools. On the left-hand side, under the heading of patient safety, if you click on that, it opens a tab menu, and if you forward one more, Jason, you will find on that slide right now as a first subheading the, work, uh, the word sepsis. If you click on that, um, you end up looking at that uh, petal in the middle where you have different subcategories, uh, and those are process and roles, tools and technology, um, learning, and leadership. And when you click on those, you will obtain more information under um, each of those um, subheadings. And if you click, for example, on the tool side, you will find some of that information from um, Providence. On the next slide, which is the last one I have, there is the submit new content item. So if you click on that, um, it opens a way to communicate by us off, by, via email of things that you would like to make available to all your partners and peers in the um, HEHC to share. So again, I, we really ask you to share what you have. Everything is valuable. It will be reviewed and will be put on the website um, for, for everybody to share. And I think uh, with that, I would like to um, hand this back over to Jason, I assume, um, to uh, listen to the um, presentations by Terry and Shelley. Great. Thank you, Dr. Tenzer. So um, without further ado, we will turn it over to Dr. Terry Clemmers, um, sort of a next couple minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jason, and uh, thank you, Andreas, uh, for the kind words. Um, we're going to talk about uh, implementation of new care process models. and. Um, it's a lot larger than just sepsis bundle. This applies to many other things. But uh, I want to go through this and some of the uh, things that we've learned over the last uh, 20 years almost on uh, how we try to spread this and disseminate it to other places. Next slide. Some of you have uh, probably seen this in the past. This is uh, one of the theories of QI. Uh, this is not original with me. This is. Uh, Something you may have seen before. Next slide. In the old days, uh, we used to do what we called quality assurance, and the idea was to make sure we didn't have practitioners that were uh, practicing poorly. And here we have a graph, uh, a measure of outcomes uh, on the x-axis, and that could be mortality or costs or length of stay or complication rates or uh, um, errors or whatever you wanted to put there. And you have kind of a bell-shaped curve. Uh, same uh, on the uh, left-hand side, of course, they're practicing uh, wisely and have better results. And the ones on the uh, right-hand side have uh, worse results. Next slide. And one of the things we used to try to do, next slide, is uh, get rid of those persons that had bad results. Uh, first of all, it's very difficult to do. Uh, but secondly, even if you get a get rid of those few individuals, but the population, the overall improvement and outcome is really not that much. Next slide. So we went over to the quality improvement side and we started looking at the other side of the equation. Next slide. And asking uh, the best care, uh, how do these people practice? 
and um, and of course we gather from the literature uh, evidence that uh, says that the outcome is better if you do this or that. Next slide. And so we try to look at this uh, triangle over here, and the idea is to can we analyze that? Can we actually uh, standardize care around those practices? And if we're uh, successful at that, next slide. Uh, then if we can get everybody to practice that way, you can see, next slide, the uh, improvement in uh, care is, uh, is huge. And so that's what uh, we'd like to focus on, next slide. And of course, that uh, bad apple, if he practices according to our new standard, moves right over and you don't have to deal with all the hassles of trying to get rid of somebody. Now that's theory, and that's very easy. Uh, to say that's the way we want it to work. But how do you get everybody to practice that way? How do you implement it? That's what it's really all about. Next slide. So theory uh, creation is easy. Implementation of that theory is very hard. Next slide. Here are some of the uh, key uh, points that we made, and I'll go over these one at a time. First of all, leadership is very important. And leadership is, in reality, all about relationships. Uh, the establishment of trust and uh, respect. And that goes two ways. Um, in the Tao Te Ching, there's a little statement saying, if you don't trust a person, you make him untrustworthy. And so uh, we need to trust our front line. The front line needs to trust us. And uh, that's one of the uh, keys. And trust is uh, developed, of course, by doing what you say you're going to do. Um, in creating a shared mission, vision, and values, and by shared I mean uh, it's something that everybody buys into. Uh, we just uh, recently changed our mission uh, statement uh, at Intermountain, and that was shared with everybody, first with leadership and then right on down the line. And uh, and the question was asked, uh, can you buy into this? Can you agree with this? And uh, we went to a, a statement that says, um, our, our mission is to, blocking on the statement. It's to, I can't believe I'm doing this. Provide the health and wellness of the community. Around health and wellness. Yeah, it's around health and wellness. It's to um, to help others live the healthiest life, life possible. Uh, and so that's our mission. And it went from giving extraordinary care to uh, making sure everybody lives the healthiest life they can. And then uh, the last two points, C and D on this, engaged in the front line. Um, Safety and quality improvement is a frontline project. If the front line are not involved, uh, whatever you develop will disappear. And so another thing you want to think about is not just dissemination, but sustainability. And sustainability means it becomes part of the work uh, flow that the front line go through. And uh, so we want to get the front line engaged, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we do that. But basically, uh, uh, what we do, at least in the clinical program I run, the Intensive Medicine Clinical Program, is uh, we set goals. We do that together. Uh, so the front line is involved in setting the goals we're going to work on. We set up measures to measure how we're going to look at that and if we're achieving the goal. And then uh, we let go of it, and we let the front line decide how they're going to meet that goal. And uh, that's, that's one of the keys of having the front line feel involved. Next slide. Now, I'm just going to go through this structure real fast, and we'll come back to that in, at the end also. But basically, our structure is uh, we have an Intermountain Healthcare Board of Trustees. Uh, sits at the top, and under them uh, we have input from the management team and the senior VPs. Uh, but the clinical program actually uh, um, goes clear to the board, 
And under the clinical programs, we have 10. They're listed there. The one that I'm involved with is in intensive medicine. And under intensive medicine, uh, we have critical care development team, emergency services development team, trauma, hospitalist, uh, telecritical care services now, and transport services. So that all falls under intensive medicine, which is a good portion of the hospital uh, hospitalized patients. And uh, I just want to explain what the role is of these different levels. Next slide. There's the front line, and the question is, is we need to connect them, next slide, up with the uh, board. The board becomes an integral part. We develop goals and things, and uh, the goal, the board is going to hold us responsible for those. Next slide. So just let's look at this little uh, piece of this. Next slide. Down at the ICU level, next slide, this is where uh, processes are scripted. Um, we then, in small rapid cycle trials, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, we find out that uh, whatever process we develop doesn't work. We've never developed a process that worked first time around. And so by doing these trials, we learn and find the problems. And this uh, develops into iterative cycles. We go around and round until we get to the point that it's safe and effective, and then we'll actually implement it. And those rapid cycle trials are very small. They're uh, just uh, one patient or one nurse's patient or one doctor's patient. We don't spread it until we know that the uh, process uh, is safe and effective. And then as we do this, it becomes part of the natural workflow. So that's done at the front line. We're talking about the nurse that's taking care of the patient um, that's uh, doing a lot of this. On the development team level, critical care services, next slide, this is where we uh, set team goals. All of the ICUs from within Intermountain, and we have 14 right now, they all come together, uh, are representatives for the, from the development, from the individual ICUs form the development team. Here we uh, develop the goal we want to work on, uh, or goals. Uh, we establish measures uh, and how we're going to measure that, and we get that lined up. Then we educate and provide tools for the front line to work with. But how they do it, and not every ICU does it the same way, uh, in sepsis, for example, uh, one of the ICUs has a full-time coordinator just bird dog in sepsis, and they have very high uh, reliability. Uh, one of the other ICUs, actually, in the southern part of the state, uh, Dixie Medical Center, just adopted that same, and they had a huge jump uh, by that coordinator uh, bird dogging things in their uh, compliance. Next slide. At the intensive medicine clinical program level, this is where we coordinate with other development teams and clinical programs. Sepsis is one of those that is much more difficult um, to get high reliability and to do spread than some of the simpler programs like a glucose uh, control program or a, a ventilator bundle or something like that. Uh, and one of the reasons is sepsis is across several different development teams. The ED has to be involved in the ICU, the hospitalists, and the acute care force. And there's also the, the difficulty with sepsis is it's time sensitive, which also makes it more difficult uh, to do. But it's at the intensive medicine little clinical program where we coordinate this. Uh, that is where most of our resources are for our data. Uh, manager and our analysts uh, to get a lot of this done. Uh, joint education is done. And here's where we also approve joint goals. And we elevate them sometimes to the level of what we call a board goal. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And the Intermountain Board has a place in all this. Next slide. And that is to align everything. And um, we'll talk about that at the end on how powerful that has been for us. 
Next slide. The other thing we've learned is you really do need to understand your current process. And uh, next slide. This example is uh, on our uh, website. Uh, this is available uh, basically to everybody who wants to look at it. And uh, here we have each one of the bundle elements. Now our bundle elements are a little bit later, different than uh, what others do, and we still use a maintenance bundle of the a lung protective strategy, the steroids, and uh, oh, and the glucose control. Uh, we've studied this, and we find these three items still to be very uh, important as far as survival. But up at the top, you can see measuring the lactate, blood cultures, antibiotics given. And the reason that we do this and present that, and we can present this as a system, as a facility, as an individual unit, uh, we can see how we're going. And uh, we've always had problems with our blood cultures and our antibiotics given in three hours. And you can see that they're uh, somewhat lower. You get down, for example, to lung protective strategy, and we've been 100% now for uh, several years. And uh, that is because of the way we build into our processes to guarantee that that's going to happen every time. So it gives you an idea about what your problems are. In 2008, one of our biggest problems was getting the lactate. And so we were failing a lot. We were only about 65 or 70 percent of our patients were getting lactate. We made that a board goal and pushed that up to near 100 percent. You can see the last couple of months it's been 100%. The thing that happened though when we pushed lactate up, because drawing a lactate doesn't improve survival, it is drawing some blood is all you're doing. But what we found is that really helps us with identifying sepsis early. So if they're thinking lactate, that means they're thinking sepsis, and we get into our sepsis bundles uh, much more quickly. So our mortality rate actually dropped significantly um, uh, when we started looking at lactates. And that's why I say you need to know what's really going on. Next slide. Um, this is another uh, one that we have. This is, again, out on the web. Anybody can look at it. This is broken down by uh, facilities or the hospital. And uh, you can see we, we look at costs and and other things here. And then we can graph those out. And I can look at one facility, I can look at one region, I can uh, slice and dice this in real time, uh, which is very nice. So the metrics uh, have been very important to us. Next slide. Now here's another one that's kind of interesting. This is, uh, we're doing sedation mobility projects now. And you can see one of the hospitals, number one down there, uh, on patients on ventilators, mechanical ventilators, are giving continuous sedation 7.2% of the time the patients on the ventilators. Other facilities are up above 70%, tenfold difference. And so by knowing this, it's very easy to get people to say, hey, what's different in these facilities? And uh, is this a project worth doing? Anytime you see this kind of variability, of course, it's well worthwhile. Next slide. Now, I'm going to take the next three together. Standardizing process forces learning. And I think that's the most important statement I want to say. If I want to learn about a process, standardize it, and you'll find out how much you don't know. One of our first examples is when we started to standardize how we're going to use a ventilator. And 14 physicians got together and hammered out a very nice protocol. Uh, it took us almost two years to get agreement among 14 physicians. And when they gave it to the respiratory therapists, they told us, we can't do that. The thing that you've developed can't be done. And it's, what do you mean it can't be done? Well, an example, you said lower the PEEP by two. Which PEEP are you talking about? What do you mean, which PEEP? Well, on the several ventilators, there's five different peeps that you could use. 
which one do you want us to lower? And so all of a sudden we quickly realized that we were doing this in isolation and uh, the therapists and nurses had to be involved if we really wanted to do it. But you learn so much. Metrics are essential. We just looked at that. Uh, but we spend usually almost a year getting our metrics set up before we launch into a project to make sure we can measure it. And then the power of small tests of change. Next slide. We use the IHI model for improvement. Uh, this was originally from uh, Tom and Kevin Nolan, and it's published in the Improvement Guide, which is a book that they published. And it starts at the top, what are we trying to accomplish? Well, we've got a name for this collaborative. We're trying to disseminate sepsis care. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. Next slide. Well, we need to measure that. How will we know the change is an improvement? So when we implement something, how will we know that it's improved uh, the dissemination? So we're going to have to measure that. Next slide. And then uh, there's many usually changed concepts within an aim. Um, in sepsis, for example, uh, we talked about lactate. Uh, that was a problem that we had, and so we said we're going to improve that, and we're going to do some simple things like we're going to we're going to put the uh, lactate blood tube and the uh, and the order for blood together. So whenever we order blood, we automatically order a lactate or blood cultures, I should say. Whenever we order blood cultures, we're going to get a lactate automatically. And then what does that do? Next slide. Well, one of the big things I've learned over the years is whatever change concept I have, it doesn't work. I have never developed a protocol that worked the first time out. On an average, we will change that protocol five times in the first day. So we need to test it. And the small rapid cycle testing, what that means is we're going to use this protocol. We're going to give it to a nurse if it's in her realm, somebody that's uh, seasoned, somebody that we uh, have confidence in. We're going to test it for one shift, the shift that she's on, and it'll usually be a day shift, so there's a physician around that can kind of be there to help her uh, if she has any questions about it. We're not going to give it to everybody to use. We're just going to test it on one patient at one time. Next slide. And so we plan the test, we do it, and then we figure out why it doesn't work. And then we act on that by changing it and then going back around this cycle until finally uh, it will work without having to be changed on one patient. Usually if I can do five patients in a row and I don't need to change it, five patients, I declare it safe and effective, and we're ready to go on. This is a powerful tool. It's powerful for several reasons. Next slide. Number one, the rapid cycle, small uh, uh, steps. Next slide. The next one is it makes the protocol development safe. Uh, the problem with setting out a protocol and just saying everybody will now use it is I know that the first protocol never works and it may actually be unsafe. That's why we do it and monitor it closely and change it as it goes. So it makes it safe. Next slide. We know it results in effective change because as we do that, we are measuring it and we see that it is working and it's effective in accomplishing the goal. Next slide. It also demonstrates that it's doable. One of our protocols, one of our early ones, uh, uh, was high glucose control. And uh, it demanded, our protocol demanded that glucose may have to be done as frequently as every hour. And the nurses came back to us after our first day and said, you know, it, it seems to work, but it's not doable. Uh, what do you mean? She says, well, it takes me about 15 minutes to do a glucose check. And if I'm doing that every hour, that's a quarter of my shift, and I don't have that kind of time. So the nurses won't be able to do this. And we uh, drilled down on that since, what do you mean it takes 15 minutes to do a glucose check? Well, the glucose check is pretty fast, but finding the glucometer is a real bear. 
And it turns out we only had one glucometer in the unit. People would use it and leave it. Nobody knew where. And so uh, just uh, rounding up the glucometer was really difficult. And so uh, the answer to that, of course, is we bought a lot of glucometers, and now uh, they do them in about two minutes. Next slide. So it's got to be doable. But as it does, and one of the projects we have now is ambulating patients. Uh, patients on ventilators, uh, we get up and walk around the unit. Um, and a lot of people uh, thought that was unsafe, that it couldn't be done, that it would take too much effort and time. And uh, so we worked through uh, all of those uh, barriers. And uh, what we found out is it is doable. And the patients actually get out of the unit faster. They're stronger when they leave the unit. And so as other people watch this develop through these small rapid changes, they agree it can be done. We see it being done all the time. And it becomes more acceptable. Maybe, yeah, maybe I can do it to my patients. If Laura can do it to hers, why can't I do it to mine? And so it's starting to drive this agreement and acceptance among the providers. Next slide. But it also ch stimulates change in the local culture. The nice thing about doing this on the front line is all of a sudden they've developed new skills, new talents. They know how to develop a protocol. They know how to test it. They know how to make it safe and doable. And all of these are skills that the front line need in order to have constant improvement within the unit. And so uh, that cultural change is as important as anything else that goes on. Uh, they're now engaged. They now can take control. Next slide. And then the last one I want to talk a little bit about is spread. And uh, spread is dependent upon organizational structure and vertical alignment. Um, I started out just in my little unit. It was uh, very comfortable. Uh, it was small enough that we could have some control. Uh, and so uh, I didn't really think much about what they were doing with the clinical programs. I just want to improve my ICU. Well, as the clinical programs came around and they finally uh, talked me into going into that, I saw an opportunity to spread to others. Next slide. But here's how this works. Down at the uh, ICU level, the 14 ICUs, this is where the ideas come from. Most of the improvements that I've made in within my ICU have come from the front line. It comes from a nurse coming to me one day and saying, you know, why do I have to ask the house staff uh, with a potassium low what to do? She says, I know what to do. And not only that, but sometimes the house staff give me the wrong answer. And that's very uncomfortable for me if they're not doing it right. And so she says, why can't we just protocolize this so the nurses, when the potassium flow, we can automatically give the right dose of potassium. And so uh, I said, fine, Vanessa, why don't we run with that? I'll help you develop a protocol, and you can test it. And all of a sudden, she got caught up in that. And even to this day, which is almost as close to 20 years later, Vanessa still owns that protocol. Uh, the nurses still go to Vanessa if they have any questions about that protocol. So that's where we try to get the ideas. If we want to spread those, then we go up to the critical care team, development team, and say, look, at, do we want to make this a goal for all of the ICUs? Um, we have a protocol. Uh, it works well. We'd like to use the same protocol everywhere if we can. But if it doesn't work in your ICU, it's okay. You can modify it just so that we get the potassiums in the right range. And so uh, we go up to that level. Now, next slide. One more. The next one is we then, once it gets developed enough, we got a good measure, we know it works, we know it's safe, we'll take it from one and we'll give it and make it a board goal. And what it means to be a board goal, that means that the board is going to hold everybody accountable to make sure that goal is reached. That means the CEO. It means Lucy Savage. It means uh, every manager, every uh, CEO of every hospital, every director. 
they are going to have their bonuses tied to those board goals. And all of a sudden, what that does for me at the front line is, if it's not going well and I need a resource, when I go to my administrator, he's much more inclined to give me the resource I need because it's now a board goal. The board goals have been very powerful. So this structure that uh, Intermountain has developed is one of our most powerful tools in getting really high reliability in what we do. I'm going to leave it at that. I think I'm a little bit over the, uh, already and ask uh, if there's any quick questions. I am going to have to leave in just a few minutes. Question for Dr. Klemmer. Jason, do they type them in? Or? Yeah, well, you can either unmute your phone and just speak up, or if you would like to put them in uh, the chat, if you'd like to type them in, just type them in the chat box. Um, if we aren't able to get to your question, or if you think of it after Dr. Clemmer has left, please still raise it, um, and we'll be in contact with him, and he can answer those questions and make sure they're available. That sounds like no questions. So um, thank you again, Dr. Clemmer. We really do appreciate your time and sharing that information with us. Um, I, I apologize to Shelley. I the most important part of my slides is the one where I show your work, Dr. Clemmer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's a good point to remind everybody that we will have the recordings of, of this whole webinar available later. So, um, so I think without any um, more delay, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Sanders for, oh, I guess there's just some additional points from Dr. Clemmer's slides, but um, Dr. Clemmer, are these any? Okay, <laughs> just extra. And the slides will be posted extra. with the video. Yes. Yeah. All right, so we will turn it over to Dr. Sanders. Go ahead. Oh, just such a pleasure to be here, and I've admired Dr. Clemmer's work so much, and just grateful for the chance to speak. Um, I'm from Providence St. Vincent in Portland, Oregon, and we have um, as our eight hospitals in Oregon men participating with the High Value Healthcare Collaborative. Um, and so I'm going to just share our story of sepsis, and I think a lot of the themes will overlap with what you've heard from Dr. Clemmer. So next slide. Um, I'm going to talk from two points of view and just tell two stories. One is about bundle adherence from the emergency room, and the second is looking at inpatient sepsis detection on the wards. And as I speak, I'll just try to give some tips that we've run across for engaging people's hearts as well as their minds, um, show how we've been able to use data as a tool for change, and then just share some real-world results, not all of which are perfect and publishable, but are headed in the right direction. So, next slide. Starting with the ED, next. Here's what I showed our ED um, team is the Intermountain Health work. If you haven't read this article recently, go back to it. It's beautiful. Look at how when process measures improve, mortality goes down at Intermountain. And I tell folks um, on the next slide, I say really our goal is to get that graph right into grandma's house where she gets to go home from the hospital to see her kids. So next slide. Um, we started our journey about three years ago with really strong administrative support across all of Oregon, but particularly at St. V's. Um, our ED physicians are all contracted and within one group, and our administration decided to incentivize them with a small financial incentive for bundle adherence. At first, the, the bundle adherence didn't really change, um, and so we felt like our lesson was administrative support is necessary but not sufficient. So next slide. Um, our next step was to identify engaged physicians and nurses from the emergency room. And we used a model that had worked previously, which was the stroke team, and thought about our sepsis group in a similar way, getting nurses and doctors to meet together. Right now we're meeting every two months. Very quickly, those physicians, as Dr. Clemmer kind of predicted, ditched what had been given them from on high and made up a workflow that actually worked in the real world. So they actually didn't use our beautiful order set that we built into Epic for them. They used quick pick lists 
off of Epic instead, and they decided not to use the electronic sepsis alert that had been built in, and I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. What they did do is take two successful workflows, which are our acute MI with a door to bundle completion time and our stroke uh, workflows, which were both based on little physical kits in the emergency room. And they said, why don't we build a sepsis kit that has our venous lactate and our two blood culture bottles and our three liters of fluid all just packaged in one kit. And then it's like this visual cue when you walk in the room as a nurse here to help out, oh, the sepsis kit is open. And here's a protocolized, actually on paper, workflow that I know I need to follow, and the vitals are due now, and I can just pick up where the last nurse left off when she got called away to a code. So our stakeholders built that, um, and they also served as champions. We just hit the next, um, next slide. What made this team functional, I would just like to call out, was um, – not just being told that they were sepsis champions or volunteering for that, but really getting them almost like a project management type support from a physician champion who was not an ED physician, was not an ICU physician, but was a general internist. And I'm not saying that the, that person would have to be an internist. I think they could be a nurse or a project manager, but I think in this situation, the reason this worked was in part because um, the physician leader was enough outside of the game to be able to see the ER as a system and um, wasn't an intensivist um, to whom it was difficult for the ER to talk back when they had um, concerns. So in our organization, it turned out that it worked out well to have sort of a general internist leading this work. So next slide. Um, we started through the High Value Healthcare Collaborative Grant, um, which funded one nurse to do case reviews. We started um, building our data on process um, bundle adherence for the four items for the three-hour bundle. And what we immediately recognized was that the ER doctors and nurses were discounting the data that they got back that said that their bundle adherence was 60%. They would throw up their hands and say, well, that patient developed criteria for severe sepsis eight hours after admission to the hospital. They've long been on the floor. How am I supposed to predict the future? No wonder our bundle adherence numbers are not very high. So we changed the way we were identifying patients. And instead of looking at their discharge diagnosis of severe sepsis or septic shock being present on admission and counting those people and giving feedback about those people, we changed our definition of the time zero and the patients that we were going to give feedback about to patients that really met criteria for severe sepsis or septic shock in the emergency room. So that now our ED doctors and nurses, when they reviewed the charts, would say, oh, that really was sepsis. And it was right here in front of my eyes on my shift. It didn't happen four hours after I left shift. Um, and the way we did that was by using an electronic sepsis alert that just detects hypotension and a venous lactate plus two or more stirs. We were running that thing in the background. The ER never saw it, but we used it to identify our cases. And our physicians and nurses then bought into the data that they got back. Um, we um, stopped using the discharge diagnosis as the case definition because those cases are all about 45 days out and we started using that electronic sepsis alert in real time and began giving feedback emails more frequently. So I'm going to show you a little graph from St. Vincent of our process bundle if you go to the next slide. And we're going to, as I tell the story, unfold what happened. So we started in July of 2014, and if you just pay attention to the bottom blue line, that's our full bundle compliance. Um, and we were at 55% when we first started auditing this. And over four months, we kind of established a pre-intervention baseline of about 60%. Next slide. We then, in October of 2014, had our physician champion send out one email where he literally had looked at the process bundle adherence for all the charts um, and gave the email just directly to the physician with a summary of their patients. Next slide. After that one email, our next month worth of data, which is about 30 patients that go through our ED, 
we hit 88% for bundle adherence. Next slide. So we were like, wow, two things, a new achievable benchmark, like stop telling me this is impossible, it actually is possible, and two, can we just declare victory and go home? Um, next slide. Of course, the world never works that way. We, um, like I'm sure all of you, cycle through sort of availability and energy in terms of our physician and nurse champions. And, um, you know, I can jump up and down and say, y'all should be doing this, um, but if the energy isn't there to give the email feedback, um, it's not done. So over the next several months, um, no feedback reached clinicians at the bedside. And you can see we returned to our baseline performance of about 50% bundle adherence sort of varying between 50 and 60 percent. So next slide. Um, we decided to try again, and this time instead of asking a physician champion to do the work of crafting an email to send to providers, um, since the hospital ha has committed to incentivizing the ER physicians by assessing their bundle adherence, there was a nurse reviewer who could take over the role of reviewing the charts. And we do this based on an electronic query that's generated because of the sepsis alert to identify the patient. And then the nurse reviewer has to review the chart to see if infection was truly present, yes or no, and then figure out the IV fluids because, of course, those are never accurate when you first look at the electronic query. What you see in front of you is a screenshot of an email that she now sends out in real time, these are five cases. She sent this email January 5, and these cover you know, the dates from December 27 to January 5. So she is now doing the work of um, creating an email that she sends to the stakeholder leaders who then forward it to the involved providers. And you know, because this is a webinar, I grade out probably the most important part of this little table, which is the medical record number of the patient and the physician's name. So as I'm a doctor and I get this little email every week in my inbox with my name on it, I can click into that spreadsheet, have a look at the case that I saw in real time while I still remember, oh, yeah, that was that 39-year-old woman. She had pilo. Um, and I can see what I did or didn't do. Um, and we found that this type of feedback that is much more timely and is provider-specific and patient-specific and clinically defined was what our physicians began to respond to. And we began to get really um, great email conversation back from doctors, dialogue, hey, I didn't think that person belonged in the sepsis group, et cetera. So next slide. We started this process in um, June at St. Vincent, and you can see we were able to push our bundle adherence back up to that achievable benchmark, which is probably in the 85 to 95 percent. And we've been able to hold that now for about four months with this workflow, uh, with that one falling out in, in November. The next slide. We elected to generalize this recipe across the eight EDs in Oregon. So this is our SharePoint site where the Excel data live. But more importantly, those emails are going out directly to those hospitals. Next slide. So here's um, our catchment right now. Providence covers five states. We're now live in Oregon. Next slide. And if you just hit enter a couple more times, you'll see on this slide, when we started in May as a baseline across all of Oregon, we were hitting our bundle adherence for 49% of the cases. And now in December, we're at 79% across all the Oregon um, severe sepsis and septic shock cases. So really happy to see the dot moving with this workflow. New line. Our new slide. <laughs> I sound like I'm dictating. Um, so just a graph of the four biggest hospitals in Oregon. We began that two-week email feedback in July everywhere except St. Vincent. St. Vincent piloted it in June. And you can just see that the bundle adherence did improve across all of those hospitals in a stepwise fashion, and we're hoping to see that maintained. New line. Our new slide. Thanks. So what is missing from our story is I would love to show you a mortality reduction. And our mortality data, of course, lag behind like I'm sure yours do. They come out of Premier. We have always had a decent mortality that's lower than expected in this population. And we are waiting to see um, if we truly see a reduction like Intermountain did down to the 8.5 or 10% range. 
new line, new slide. So in summary, um, securing the administrative support and leadership support and nurse and physician champions was very helpful, um, but really I think the crux of our workflow was providing meaningful data in real time and then just repeating that cycle across the different hospitals in Oregon. So I can see we're short on time. I'm just going to quickly go to the next slide and talk about inpatient work just briefly and folks can connect with me after they're interested. Next slide. Um, on the inpatient side at St. Vincent, our observed mortality was much higher than expected. And if you just forward, go next, go next, go next. We started educating that um, severe sepsis is a body attack, just like a heart attack. We started educating that door to bundle time would be similar to door to balloon time and tried to build that sense that sepsis is an emergency. Next slide. Um, next slide. Um, we built an inpatient order set with frequent vital signs and call parameters. Next slide. Uh, next slide. And you can click enter three more times. <laughs> Thank you. One more. So we built a sepsis rule to try to help with diagnosis, and it runs in the uh, foreground in EPIC, New Line. Your next slide. We spread that across all of the five hospitals in Oregon. It provides an alert page in real time to the ministries listed on the left, and it provides an, a pop-up in EPIC at the ministries listed on the right. Next slide. Um, we measured our response to that sepsis alert with a goal of seeing every patient with rapid response team. And right now our provider notification is about 70%. So about 70% of the time the rapid response team goes to the bedside, we want to shoot much higher than that. Next slide. We did some root cause analysis to improve the sepsis rule itself and reduce false alarms. Next slide. Um, and after all that work, our mortality was still high. Next slide. So we decided to do case review, root cause analysis, and just click on through these, let people just flash at those. Um, next slide. And we wound up deciding that we needed a code sepsis team. We were able to implement this without a physician by using rapid response team, house supervisor, IV therapy, and phlebotomy to respond to sepsis alerts, and then call the attending of record to get orders to deliver the bundle, and then we built in a scripted two-hour phone call back to the doctor to say, how is the patient doing? Next slide. And next slide. And next slide. So we uh, reviewed all 48 cases during our pilot, because like Dr. Clemmer said, nothing ever works the way you think it's going to work the first time. Um, you can push next. Um, we found that the provider was notified about 70% of the time and that about 26 of the 48 cases were truly sepsis. Next slide. Um, what we found was that we were able to deliver the sepsis bundle to all eight of the patients where we actually call the code sepsis, and that our mortality for the first time since I've been working on this problem, just like all of you, for two to five years, is finally approaching the expected mortality. I don't know if it will hold. I don't know if code sepsis was the route we needed to take. But I thought it's useful to just share our story and to give you a sense of what we're doing and how we've gotten sort of logically moving forward through some of the things that Dr. Klammer, um described. So it's one minute till one. Sorry to rush. Any thoughts or questions? Questions for Dr. Sanders, please. You can type those in or unmute your line. And while people may be formulating the questions, um, thank you, Dr. Sanders, for condensing your presentation. As we mentioned before, we'll have the recording and then the slides um, for people available to review in more detail. Any questions? Okay, great. Well, and, and again, if any questions come up, you can feel free to email the program office or us at the admin at hvhcsafety.org. Um, it looks like we're right at the end of the hour, so I want to thank everybody, particularly Dr. Tenzir, Dr. Klemmer, and Dr. Sanders again for their presentation. Thanks. I hope you all have a great day.